matter in more detail. Thank you. And we turn now to First Minister's questions. And uh, as members and others may be aware, this will be our first First Minister's questions without an open or diary question. And leaders will begin uh, by asking their substantive questions. On that note, question number one, Ruth Davidson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The First Minister said on Tuesday that she wanted to open a discussion on tax. So let's begin right now. Uh, I am opposed to all current basic rate taxpayers paying more in income tax. Can the First Minister just confirm that she is too? First Minister. Well, usually when you open a debate and commit to listening to what others have to say, uh, it makes sense to carry on and do that before ruling things out in advance. Let me be quite clear uh, about the principles that will guide this government. Firstly, uh, we will always, as we always have done, set tax rates responsibly and with the interest of households, businesses, the wider society and economy firmly at heart. Uh, we will also not uh, simply transfer the burden of austerity onto the shoulders of those who can least afford it. But I think as we look forward over the next few years, we owe ourselves a genuine debate about what kind of society and economy we want to be. We know that we face further Westminster austerity imposed by Ruth Davidson's party. We know that we face the implications of Brexit, implications that Ruth Davidson thinks the country might never recover from. And there are a range of other pressures, demographic pressures, for example. So if we want, as I certainly do, this country to continue to have the highest quality public services, well-paid public servants, the support and the infrastructure that our businesses need to thrive, and if we want to have effective policies to tackle poverty, then I think we do need to have an honest, mature debate about how best to deliver that. And that's the debate that this government will lead. Now, if the Tories want to sit on the sidelines of that, uh, calling day in and day out, as they do for extra spending on a range of different things, while also calling for tax cuts for the richest in our society, then the Tories will continue to have not a shred of credibility. Now, Ruth Davidson keeps telling us she wants to be taken seriously. Now, we will all get an opportunity to see whether she's up to that or not. Ruth Davidson. I think anyone earning less than £43,000 a year in Scotland just heard the First Minister's message loud and clear. She's coming for your paycheck. But let me ask you the next question. In her general election manifesto, published just 100 days ago, the First Minister said this. There is a risk that an increase in the additional rate of income tax in Scotland alone would lead to a loss of revenue. Does she believe that that risk has somehow disappeared in the last 100 days? First Minister. It is exactly the risks as well as the benefits of different tax policies that we have said we're going to set out openly and honestly and allow this Parliament and the wider public to have a mature debate about that. It's because of concerns I had uh, about raising the additional rate in Scotland alone that we didn't do it last year. Instead, I asked the Council of Economic Advisers to give us advice on that. Uh, and of course, we have consistently taken a very responsible approach to taxation. That is right and proper for any government. But we also have a responsibility to everybody in our country to make sure that as we go into the next decade and beyond, we are protecting the public services that all of us depend on, that we are ensuring that our nurses, our doctors, our police officers, our teachers, our firefighters are well rewarded. That's why I have said we are going to lift the 1% public sector pay cap. It's vital that we make sure that the support our businesses need, whether that's the additional investment in R&D uh, that I have announced in the last few days, or the transport and digital infrastructure that our businesses need to thrive is there as well. So what I am saying is that as a, a parliament, as a country, let's have that mature and honest debate. Uh, I know my party will take part in it with an open mind. Um, given their positions on taxation, uh, I hope and believe that Labour, the Greens, the Liberals will take part in that debate with an open mind. But I suspect, based on what we've heard and are hearing today from Ruth Davidson, what we will continue to get from the Tories is daily demands yes. for extra spending yeah. In the last week alone, it's been Frank's law, which I'm delighted that we will go ahead with. It's been extra spending for more housing. I think we've just heard somebody call for extra spending uh, on the National Health Service. Uh, the Tories want extra spending, but they also want tax cuts for the richest. That is not a credible position, but that should hardly be surprising because the Tories increasingly are not a credible party. 
Ruth Davidson. In that answer, the First Minister said twice about, talked twice about supporting what our businesses need and supporting what Scotland's businesses need. So let's listen to Scotland's business community, shall we? Today, David Lonsdale of the Scottish Retail Consortium. Any notions about increasing income tax rates should be knocked firmly on the head, as it could cast a pall over consumer spending, which is the mainstay of Scotland's economy. Liz Cameron, the Chief Executive of the Scottish Chambers of Commerce. It is growing the Scottish economy, not squeezing the last drops out of existing businesses and workers that will generate more tax revenues. Increasing tax rates beyond that of our neighbours could well deliver the opposite result. Scotland's businesses are telling you what they want and need and you're not listening. And the question is the same and we've been here before. If raising taxes in Scotland damages the Scotland's Scottish economy and it leads to the loss of revenue that your own manifesto talked about, which is the money we need to spend on our NHS and schools, why would any responsible government do it? First Minister. Well, let's just cover a few points here. Firstly, let's look at Scotland's economy, which faces challenges. Uh, but we have seen in the most recent statistics uh, Scotland's economy growing four times as fast as the economy elsewhere in the UK. We have unemployment in Scotland today close to the lowest level on record, employment at a record high. Youth unemployment, half the rate it was uh, 10 years ago. So uh, we're seeing progress in Scotland's economy, which we must continue to protect. And that I am absolutely clear about. Second point that I think is worth making, presiding officer, because it's one that day and daily right now, everybody across the country uh, is becoming ever clearer about. And that is one of the reasons why we are having these debates right now is because of the damage that firstly Tory austerity is doing and now the reckless Tory Brexit is threatening to do to our economy. Uh, I think frankly it is beyond belief uh, that Ruth Davidson can say as she did yesterday that she thinks Brexit might do damage to this country that it will never recover from and yet expects us just to carry on with Brexit regardless. Ruth Davidson frankly should hang her head in shame. The next point about consumer spending is this. It's because I want to see consumer uh, spending protected is that I think it's time to give our public sector workers uh, a pay rise as well as fairness for them. So we will continue to take these decisions uh, responsibly and with the interests of the country as a whole at heart. But you know, our businesses need investment as well. They need investment in health, in education, in skills, in infrastructure. All of that has to be paid for. Uh, and we all want, or at least those of us on this side of the chamber, want high quality public services. So we will lead that open, honest, mature debate about how as a country we best provide the services and the business support that we need. Uh, I don't know whether the Tories will want to be part of that debate or, or whether they will simply call for more and more spending and more and more tax cuts for the richest. But I'm determined to lead a debate that is right for the overall interests of this country that I'm proud to be First Minister of. Ruth Davidson. The First Minister opened by talking about how the last quarter figures showed Scotland growing faster than the rest of the UK. She's absolutely right. I welcome that. It doesn't erase the fact that for 10 years, and over the last 10 years, we've been growing slower. And we're talking about how do we keep us growing faster. And punitive tax rates is not the way to do that. And as I said on Tuesday, in response to the First Minister's statement, there is room for consensus in this Parliament. Indeed, I welcome some of the ideas in the economy the First Minister puts forward, like, for example, cutting ABD in order to stimulate economic growth. But we have to get the balance right. And jacking up taxes on working families and businesses in Scotland will damage the government's stated objective of getting the economy growing faster and of bringing in more revenue. And as Liz Cameron adds today in what she has said as the voice of Scottish business, the biggest concern here is over the message that tax rises send out about Scotland's reputation as a place which values ambition, that welcomes business and that wants to grow. So in the spirit of a mature debate, doesn't the First Minister accept that by going down this route, she risks damaging that reputation, as Liz Cameron says, and stifling the ambitions that all Scots should share? Yeah. Briefly, First Minister. The reputation of this country right now is the isolationist, inward-looking yeah, Brexit yeah, approach yeah, yeah, of the yeah. Tories. What is damaging this country right now are things like leaked Home Office proposals showing that the Tories 
want to punish uh, people who come from other countries uh, and introduce measures that would be devastating for our economy. But back to the, the tax issue. We will have this debate involving everybody, including business, because their views are hugely important, as are the views of those who work in our public services and the public at large. But you know what, what message I want to send about Scotland? And I want to send it to people here at home, to people elsewhere in the UK and people internationally. I want to send the message that is Scotland is the best place in the world to grow up in and be educated. Scotland is the best place in the world to be cared for if you're sick or vulnerable or in need. Scotland is the best place in the world uh, to grow old in. And it's the best place in the world because of our investment in infrastructure, in digital, in business support, to invest and do business in as well. That's the message I want to send to the world about Scotland. And all of us need to make sure we do what is necessary to deliver that kind of world-class nation. Question number two, Alec Rowley. Presiding Officer, Labour has been calling for and will very much welcome such a debate on how we invest in Scotland's future moving forward because we cannot continue with failed Tory austerity. Presiding Officer, on Tuesday before the programme of government was announced, a set of statistics detailing the performance of our National Health Service were published. Our hospitals don't have enough doctors, nurses and midwives. Hundreds of operations have been cancelled because hospitals cannot cope. And two years on from the Health Secretary promising to abolish delayed discharges, over a thousand patients were stuck in hospitals when they were fit to go home. These surely dreadful figures, but perhaps the most damning of all, one in five young people needed treatment for med med mental health and they had to wait longer than the agreed waiting time. What does the First Minister propose to do about this? First Minister. Well, Al Alec Rowley, and uh, firstly, can I uh, take the opportunity to welcome Alec Rowley to his place, albeit temporarily, but I'm sure we'll enjoy our exchanges over the next uh, few weeks. Uh, firstly, Alec Rowley raises a number of extremely important and serious issues. Let me just uh, say, uh, before I address uh, what we are doing about these issues, uh, a, a number of points that he alluded to. Firstly, in terms of uh, people working in our National Health Service, there are almost 12,000 more people working in our National Health Service today than was the case when this government took office. In terms of delayed discharge, we see the bed days lost to delayed discharge uh, reducing, and we are determined to reduce that even further. Uh, the rate of uh, cancellation of hospital uh, operations, uh, while there will always be a small number of hospital operations cancelled for a number of reasons, that rate had remained uh, steady over the years and has not uh, significantly uh, increased. Uh, so that's some of the context to this. In terms of uh, what we are doing, though, I've spoken about this many times, as have other members. Uh, we have a health service that you know, is not facing unique challenges, but it's facing the challenge of rising demand, partly from an ageing population, partly in terms of some of the issues around mental health that Alec Rowley raises from the reducing stigma uh, of mental health. And we have a challenge now, in common with many other countries, of both investing in and reforming our health service so it can meet those challenges for the future. So in terms of investment, uh, the health budget today is around £3 billion higher than it was when this government took office. And we have given a commitment to a further £2 billion increase over the life of this parliament. So that's why in the programme for government, I committed to at least a real terms increase in the resource budget next year. And I say again, as I said many times to Kezia Dugdale, uh, that is a, a higher commitment to NHS investment than Labour uh, made in its manifesto for the Scottish Parliament elections. Uh, but secondly, we are committed to a programme of reform in our National Health Service. That means transferring more of the health budget into community and primary care and mental health services. So investment and reform, these are the challenges we are taking forward. Some of these uh, issues are difficult and will involve difficult decisions uh, in this chamber. But I would ask all members across uh, the chamber to get involved in these discussions so that collectively we take the decisions now that will equip our health service for the future. Alec Rowley. I would certainly, as, as the First Minister, would expect dispute 
the, the figures in terms of who committed to what. But actually, it's more important than that because too many children in Scotland are being let down, and that, that is the key serious issue that we have here. My approach has always been on these big issues that we should try and work together with the government to find a solution. But a year ago this week, Labour published a proposal that would end the scandal of poor support for child mental health. And we put these proposals directly to the First Minister. We called for three things. We called for a review of why so many children were being rejected from treatment. We asked for a guaranteed access for every secondary school to a qualified and experienced school counsellor. And we asked for this government to finally use the taxpayers of the Scottish Parliament to stop the cuts to local public services and invest where investment is needed. And nowhere is it more clear that we need to invest than in mental health services and in particularly children's mental health services. The First, the First Minister said she would look at that plan closely. Did she do this? Did she take on board any of these proposals? And if so, can she give us an update on what progress is being made? First Minister. Uh, well, I, I, I do recall uh, the session of First Minister's questions where uh, those plans uh, were raised. I did give a commitment then uh, to consider them as part of our finalisation of the mental health strategy. And yes, we have taken forward many of the things that Alec Rowley talks about. In fact, uh, one in particular I'm surprised he doesn't know about because I think it was in uh, this chamber at a session of FMQs that announced that we committed to, for example, a review of CAM's rejected uh, referrals. And we're beginning at that review, which was the first of the uh, issues that Alec Rowley referred to. In terms of school provision, we also committed in uh, our uh, mental health strategy to review of personal and social education in schools to make sure that vital link between education and uh, health services is recognised and strengthened. Uh, and uh, lastly, in terms of tax, we've had many uh, debates in tax over the past couple of years. Last, uh, in last year's budget, of course, we did take the decision uh, we took around uh, the threshold for the higher rate of tax uh, opposed by the Conservatives uh, and of course Labour uh, encouraged us to go further and as I've just debated with Ruth Davidson I do think the time is right now to look at how we fund our public services uh, in the longer term. That is a, a debate that I hope and expect uh, Labour will take part in constructively but on the issues of mental health uh, as I've said before we're seeing rising demand for mental health services that puts an onus on the government to make sure the services are there. We are committed to the work to ensure that that is the case so we do see uh, improvement in waiting times for example we see a significant increase in the mental health workforce to support those expanded services and we'll continue to take the action and invest the resources that bring about those improvements. Alec Bradley. President Officer, I'm certainly aware that this week's programme for government does have clear commitments to look at this and that would be welcome and Labour will work with the government on that but what we're saying is we actually need action Action speaks louder than words. I don't know if the First Minister or the Deputy First Minister have ever been in schools and talked to teachers about the importance of having counselling services. I have, and I know that schools value those services and want to see those services. The government has a target, but that target has never been met. More than 9,000 young people have waited too long for treatment. This cannot be allowed to continue. And it is your government that needs to do something about this. Not next year, but start to do it now. I say actions speak louder than words. I asked the First Minister how many times does the issue of children's mental health services need to be raised in this parliament before you and your government will do something about it? I... Again, succinctly, First I, I think Alec Rowley is and I mean this genuinely, a very considered and a very uh, fair politician. And I often appreciate the way, uh, the very constructive way in which he raises issues. And I would uh, include today in that. But I do think Alec Rowley is being uh, 
a tad unfair in terms of her character, his characterisation of the, the government's approach. Take just some of the issues he's raised. I already referred to the review of uh, rejected referrals. Uh, Labour called for a review and it is a review that is now happening. But in terms of uh, additional resources in schools, the pupil equity funding uh, that we put in place last year is already supporting head teachers and teachers in schools where they think that is appropriate to help them uh, close the attainment gap, invest in measures like that. That's concrete action underway uh, right now as we speak. The mental health strategy, uh, which of course is now finalised and being implemented, backed by new resources, is helping us to continue the progress we've already made on increasing the workforce in CAMS and also reducing the time uh, that young people wait. So these are hugely important issues. I, you know, I'm not standing here saying that there's not more work for us to do. Of course there is. Uh, and I would expect and, and, and welcome the fact uh, that those who care about these issues press us to go further and faster. That is absolutely legitimate. What I don't accept is Alec Rowley's characterisation that the government has done and is doing nothing, because that is manifestly not the case. So I would encourage Alec Rowley, and I certainly will play my part in this, let us come together where we can to make sure we take the right decisions uh, to uh, ensure that young people get access to the mental health services that they do deserve and do need. And a couple of constituency questions. The first from Ben McPherson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I remind the Chamber that I am a parliamentary liaison officer to the First Minister. Presiding Officer, on the 10th of August, one of my constituents, a 10-year-old boy, was callously run over by a recklessly driven stolen motorcycle in North Edinburgh on Ferry Road, which borders my constituency in Alex Cole Hamilton's. The young victim of this shocking hit and run was left fighting for his life with severe injuries. He was only discharged from hospital yesterday, and I'm sure the Parliament will join me in wishing him well and a full recovery. This terrible incident is one of the most serious that have taken place in a series of dangerous and anti-social motorbike offences in North Edinburgh over a number of years, perpetrated by a small group of offenders. Local politicians like myself and others have been working collaboratively with Police Scotland, City of Edinburgh Council, the Crown and Procurator Fiscal Service, local youth work groups and other partners to tackle this criminality, which no community should have to endure. Therefore, can I ask the First Minister what action the Scottish Government is taking to tackle the dangerous joyriding of motorcycles in North Edinburgh? And can more be done to address this serious issue? First Minister. Well, firstly, um, I'm grateful to Ben McPherson for raising uh, what is an extremely serious issue. Uh, first and foremost, of course, uh, the case that he refers to uh, was a terrible tragedy. And I want to take the opportunity today to offer my sincere condolences to the young boy's family and friends, uh, and indeed to the whole community in North Edinburgh. Um, as this tragedy, uh, and indeed Ben McPherson's comments, uh, illustrate there is a real and significant risk of serious harm from the theft and illegal use of motorbikes, uh, harm to residents and also the young people themselves who are engaging in this illegal behaviour. Uh, so it has to be stopped and I know that agencies are working with local MSPs uh, and importantly the community in North Edinburgh to find solutions. Uh, local partnership is key to confronting the behaviour uh, and dealing with underlying issues and I know that Stronger North uh, Group has played an important role in this. There are a series of initiatives being put in place by the police, by the council and by community groups to divert young people from crime and Scottish Government officials uh, from Safer Communities and Youth Justice are also engaging with the police, local agencies and third sector partners, including the Robertson Trust, to see uh, what more can be done. Uh, I know the Cabinet Secretary for Justice wrote to Ben McPherson uh, last month to set out a range of initiatives and resources uh, that are working in this area, and I can give uh, Ben McPherson a commitment today that we will continue to engage constructively to ensure that the government is playing our part in finding the solutions to this very serious issue. Gordon Lindhurst. <coughs> The First Minister will be aware of reports about a constituent I have been assisting in Edinburgh, Lydia Reid, who has recently discovered that her son's coffin was buried in 1975 with no body in it. This revelation comes after 42 years of her seeking to discover what happened to the remains of her child and her leading the campaign which exposed how hospitals had unlawfully kept deceased children's body parts for research purposes. Will the First Minister commit to finding the answers to what happened in Lydia Reid's case, and can she confirm that everything will be done to discover whether this has happened to other families as well? 
First Minister. Well, firstly, I am uh, obviously aware of this case and I, I, I want to take the opportunity to uh, give my uh, sympathies to Lydia Reid and, and to her family. Um, it is, I think, very difficult for uh, any of us who haven't gone through uh, experiences like this to fully appreciate and understand the distress uh, that Lydia Reid uh, and any others in similar situations would be experiencing. I, uh, can only imagine uh, what that must be. Uh, I can give an assurance today, clearly there has been uh, some work around uh, issues uh, of this nature in the past, but I will give an assurance today that the relevant minister uh, will be happy to meet with Lydia Reid to see uh, what the Scottish Government uh, or our agencies can do to try to ensure that she gets the answers that she certainly deserves uh, and will personally feel she needs in order to allow her to move on uh, from uh, this uh, revelation. So I will give that assurance to the member today and will take steps to ensure that that meeting happens as soon as possible. Question number three, Patrick Harvey. Thank you. Uh, one issue that the Greens were pleased to see in this week's programme for government was a commitment to roll out family financial health checks, something my colleague Alison Johnson has been campaigning for persistently measures to maximise the in incomes of some of the most vulnerable families in our society. The, the government has committed to implement this by spring next year and we look forward to working with the government to ensure that that work is fully funded and that it helps the maximum number of people possible in Scotland. But there's much more that we need to do to reduce poverty in Scotland, especially in light of the impact of the UK government's extended even more harmful benefit cap. Uh, research we've conducted shows that it's hit 3,700 more households and 11,000 children in Scotland, well over a 400% increase uh, in Glasgow alone. 64% of these households are single parents, uh, and the vast majority of them, of course, uh, are women. On average, these households are receiving £57 a week less than they're assessed as needing. In short, this cap targets families with children who are already poor and makes them even poorer. Now, the Scottish Government has allocated some funds to mitigate this, but is the First Minister aware of the evidence presented by the Child Poverty Action Group that the discretionary housing payments intended to achieve this are falling well short of what's required. Some councils uh, indeed have indicated uh, that we uh, are not in a position uh, to uh, award discretionary housing uh, payments uh, for cases affected by the benefit cap. Some councils indicating they cannot do this at all. Is the First Minister aware of that shortfall and what will be done to make it up? First Minister. Well, I'm very happy to, to look at this in, in more detail. We have uh, used discretionary housing payments, uh, which of course are administered by local authorities, uh, to try to mitigate a number of the welfare changes that uh, the UK government has, has made. Uh, the ones Patrick Harvey uh, has talked about today, but also of course we uh, have used discretionary housing payments to make sure that nobody in Scotland has to pay the bedroom tax, for example, until such times as we can legally uh, abolish the bedroom tax. So inevitably, uh, discretionary housing payments come <coughs> under pressure and we have, I know in the past, I, I used to, in previous ministerial responsibilities, uh, have oversight of this. I know we have had ongoing discussions with local authorities uh, about discretionary housing payments and the sufficiency of them. So we will continue to have uh, those discussions and we'll try to make sure uh, that they are uh, operating in a way that allows us to mitigate the impact uh, of these welfare changes as much as possible. Um, you know, this, we're almost at the end of a week in which uh, the United Nations uh, has described the UK government's approach to disabled people uh, as a human uh, catastrophe. Um, now, I know that's not the particular issue Patrick Harvey raises, but it does shine a light on the inhumanity of the welfare policies of the Conservative government at Westminster, and they should hang their heads in shame day in and day out for the misery that they are inflicting on vulnerable people the length and breadth of this country. Uh, so we will do whatever we can to mitigate that, and I'm happy to give an undertaking to Patrick Harvey today uh, that I will talk to Jean Freeman, uh, look particularly at the evidence he's talking about, and have a discussion with local authorities about whether there's further action we need to take. Patrick Harvey. The First Minister is of course right to challenge the decisions of the UK government, but in the face of the crisis that those decisions have created, the Scottish government and the Scottish parliament have a responsibility to act. There are councils down south, such as Croydon, which are taking a much more proactive approach at ensuring 
that they give the advice, the proactive work, the advice to all families to maximize their incomes where possible. So the approach that we've suggested on maximizing households' income through the family health check could be taken at council level as well to ensure that all families are able to access the DHP payments if they need it. Does the First Minister agree, first of all, that there's a need for consistency across councils and that national guidance to achieve this uh, would be uh, one step in the way of achieving that comprehensive approach? But also that the Scottish Government's own figures show something in the region of £2 million uh, reduced in payments nationally through the initial cap, another £9 million or so on top of that from the extended cap, and the Scottish Government's allocation is only in the order of £8 million. So the shortfall, the shortfall is inevitably going to lead to more debt arrears, more evictions, more hunger and more hardship. Does the First Minister acknowledge the urgency of closing that gap, ensuring that councils not only take a comprehensive approach to the advice they're giving, but have the resources available to make the payments that are so urgently needed by many families in Scotland? The First Minister. Uh, well, firstly, I would be happy to look at evidence or experiences uh, from anywhere else across the UK that might inform uh, our approach. So the, the Croydon example that Patrick Harvey uses is one that I'm certainly happy to look at. Uh, having said that, I would doubt very much if there is any part of the UK right now doing more to mitigate Tory welfare cuts than Absolutely. the Scottish yeah. Government yeah. is Absolutely. doing right now. We are spending uh, hundreds of millions of pounds over the life of a Parliament doing uh, just that. Money, frankly, that I would far rather be investing in our National Health Service yeah. or in our education yeah. system yeah. or in almost anything other uh, than mitigating the cruel policies of, of a Tory Government. Um, in terms of uh, the second part of Patrick Har Harvey's questions about consistency, Yes, I do agree, and indeed that's one of the reasons why the programme for government referred to the rollout uh, of family health checks. Uh, I do believe uh, things like that are often best delivered locally, but within a framework of national guidance, and of course we'll, we'll, we'll put forward more detail on that shortly. Uh, and then the final point is in terms of of the quantum of the resources we can make available. Uh, we will continue to do everything we possibly can to mitigate these cuts. Uh, but when you're mitigating something, as opposed to removing it at source, there are always going to be constraints and limitations on what you can do. When the Tories make these heartless cuts, uh, I wish they wouldn't, but when they do, they don't hand to the Scottish Government our share of the savings that they make to allow us to decide how we do that. Every pound of mitigation that we allocate is a pound that we're having to take from other parts of the Scottish budget. So we will do everything we can, but let's be in no doubt that the real solution here is not mitigation. Uh, the real long-term solution is to get these powers out of the hands of Tories at Westminster yeah, yeah. and into the hands of this parliament. I'm conscious that it's taken 33 minutes to get through the party leaders' questions with only two constituency supplementaries. I would just encourage some of the questions and some of the answers have been welcomingly succinct. I would encourage all the party leaders and the First Minister please to keep the questions and the answers brief and to the point. This is not a conversation, it's a question and answer session. I've got a number of members, I've got a number of members to get through. If can we start, if we make progress, Mark Ruskell, please. Mark Ruskell. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Last week, the First Minister's Government approved mansions, a hotel, golf course and tennis centre on the protected park of Keir near Dunblane. This decision overruled the local development plan, it overruled Stirling Council, and it even overruled the government's own planning reporter. Did the First Minister's Government not, not learn anything from the disastrous decision to approve Trump's golf resort? Celebrities should not rule the planning system. And despite the, the celebrity spin, the real National Tennis Centre is only two miles up the road at Stirling University. So can the First Minister guarantee that there will be no public funding to bail out the Park of Keir project if it fails, and that public funds will only be used to support genuine community tennis facilities in Scotland? First Minister. Well, first, I'm not sure if the member was trying to put Judy Murray into the same category as Donald Trump. I certainly hope uh, not, but, but moving on uh, from that, planning decisions are taken in line, absolutely in line with planning rules uh, and no other considerations uh, are taken into account. 
Uh, the planning minister carefully considered all aspects of the reporter's uh, report and concluded that the development is of regional and national significance for sport. Uh, ministers are therefore minded to grant planning permission in principle, subject to conditions, and uh, the conditions uh, have been set out. For example, uh, residential development not to be occupied until the tennis and golf centre is built and open for use. Uh, ministers have also specified that before consent can be granted a legal agreement between the councillor, uh, council and developer must be concluded and that will commit the developer to contributing towards affordable housing and education provision in the area. So the next step in this process is for the council and the developer uh, to discharge a legal agreement uh, and then it will be uh, up to ministers to determine uh, whether planning permission is then formally granted. Now, because of all that, this of course is still uh, a live planning uh, matter and I'm not going to say any more than that. But the point I will underline in all of this, and I absolutely understand the disappointment in any planning application uh, of those who oppose it if it is then granted, uh, but these decisions are taken in line with due process. That's the way it should be and that's the way it always will be. Question number four, Stuart McMillan. <coughs> Thank you, Presenting Officer. To ask the First Minister what assurances the Scottish Government has received regarding the transfer of powers to Scotland following Brexit. First Minister. Uh, the UK Government's white paper on the withdrawal bill uh, stated that it expected a significant increase in the decision making power of each devolved administration, uh, but I have to say the opposite, as things stand, is the case. Uh, the bill centralises to Westminster uh, powers on all matters currently subject to EU, including in devolved areas. Uh, in other words, matters that should properly be exercised in this parliament. Um, and of course, it also imposes new and uh, I think unworkable restrictions on the powers of the parliament uh, in these areas. So it's for these reasons uh, that both I uh, and indeed the First Minister of Wales have made clear we will not recommend consent to the bill unless appropriate amendments are made to deal with those concerns. Stuart McMillan. I thank the First Minister for that reply. And, but can the First Minister confirm that there has been no joint ministerial committee meetings since February? There has been a lack of constructive activity from the UK Government to both Scotland and Wales, and that the Brexit discussions being led by David Davis are showing a complete lack of vision from the UK Government. And does the First Minister agree with me that the UK Government's shambolic approach thus far is just a naked power grab? First Minister. Well, firstly, on the power grab, when I was uh, giving my first answer and uh, talking about uh, the replacement of EU law in devolved areas uh, with unilateral Westminster decision making, I heard somebody from the Tory bench benches, uh, I don't know who it was, uh, shout from a sedentary position, rubbish. Uh, the House of Commons issued a briefing paper on the Brexit bill uh, last Friday. Uh, here's what the House of Commons briefing paper says. The bill effectively re-reserves to the UK Parliament oh. those areas of competence uh, within competencies which have otherwise been devolved. Oh. Re-reserves. Oh. That is, I suppose, polite language for a naked power grab. So that is why, in all conscience, uh, I will not say to this Parliament and recommend to this Parliament uh, that we should approve this bill. Of course, we continue to discuss with the UK Government uh, sensible amendments, uh, and we hope that we will achieve sensible amendments. As I said the other day, if, if that doesn't prove possible, we're also looking at the possibility of continuity legislation in this Parliament. Uh, but all of these discussions would be helped if we had a UK Government that was willing to enter into them in any kind of meaningful way. There hasn't been a Joint Ministerial Committee meeting since February of this year. Uh, the papers that the UK Government have been publishing, many of them in devolved areas, have been published without any consultation with any of the devolved administrations whatsoever. So not only is the UK Government treating devolved administrations with contempt, I think as we have all seen in the past number of weeks, they are leading the UK blindly off a cliff edge. This is a UK government that has lost its way, lost the plot, has no idea whatsoever what it is doing. Question number five. Question number five, Liz Smith. Uh, to ask the First Minister what the Scottish Government's response is to the concerns that have been expressed regarding the efficacy of the National Four qualification. First Minister. Well, the National Four is a significant achievement for many pupils. It represents the right level of qualification to reflect their attainment while still offering a route for pupils to go on to obtain National Fives and uh, even Hires. 
Uh, concerns have, however, been expressed about aspects of the qualification, not least that it does not include an external exam, and that is why there is currently an expert review. Um, I would say, however, that attempts by some uh, to use these concerns to denigrate the academic achievements of tens of thousands of young people who have been awarded these qualifications I think is disgraceful. It is unwarranted and it also does a deep disservice to our young people who work hard to achieve these qualifications. Liz Smith. Uh, First Minister, in light of what you have just said, it was February 2014 when the Education Committee of this Parliament heard concerns from teacher representatives that National 4 was not highly valued as a qualification because of the absence of that exam. That concern was repeated at the Education Committee in November 2016 when teachers made very clear that they felt that as a result, too many pupils were being pushed into taking National 5 exams when that was not in their best educational interest. And today, the results of the SQA survey are telling us exactly the same thing. Could I ask you, First Minister, why, when this is so important to youngsters, has it taken two and a half years to start addressing this problem? First Minister. Well, firstly, the decision not to have an exam at National 4 was actually made following discussions at the Qualifications Governing Group, uh, which is a body that includes uh, teachers. And it was aiming to ensure that more time is spent on learning uh, rather than assessment. Uh, of course, uh, we have had concerns uh, raised now. That is why uh, there has been a review established uh, and is being undertaken by the Assessment and National Qualifications Group. That group is made up of the SQA Education Scotland, EIS and other stakeholders. It's chaired by the Deputy First Minister. I think if changes are to be made, it's important that these changes are properly thought through, taking account of the views of a range of education bodies and other stakeholders, um, and also recognising uh, some of the other changes that are being made to National Fives uh, and Hires. Uh, so these are decisions that we will take forward uh, with proper uh, consideration and process. But I say again, while it is right that concerns are recognised, while it is right that changes are made if there is a consensus around those changes, uh, let's make sure, and I'm not saying Liz Smith is doing this, but some have, let's make sure that we don't undermine the achievements of young people who work hard for these qualifications. As the EIS General Secretary, uh, Larry Flanagan, said just this week, for many pupils gaining a National Four Award, it's a significant step, and we are clear that this achievement should be celebrated. Uh, I agree with that wholeheartedly. Question number six, Monica Lennon. Thank you. To ask the First Minister what the Scottish Government's response is to the reported significant increase in the number of deaths related to drug and alcohol misuse in the last year. First Minister. Well, firstly, I'd like to put on record my uh, deepest sympathy to any family who has lost a loved one uh, through drug use. Uh, we recognise that behind these numbers there are individual tragedies and loss of life which is uh, devastating. Uh, the rise that we've seen of course is the result of the growing older of many long-term drug users who go on to experience a range of uh, chronic conditions as they do uh, get older and we know from the recent report from NHS Health Scotland uh, there is a, an established link between the rise in drug deaths now uh, and previous austerity policies of the 1980s and that actually should uh, tell us something about not repeating uh, these mistakes for the future. Uh, of course the Scottish Government has a responsibility to act and we are determined to do that. The programme for government sets out an additional £20 million investment for alcohol and drug services and our new drug strategy will be based on the principle of seek, keep and treat to recognise that problems of substance misuse must be addressed from a public health perspective. Monica Lennon. I thank the First Minister for her reply. I do have deep concerns about the funding and adequacy of recovery services, but I want to focus on a different barrier to recovery, the stigma around addiction. Living with addiction is not easy to speak about, but this has to change as recovery and support services can't help people if they feel too ashamed to access them. Too often, families only break their silence about drug and alcohol harm after they have buried their loved ones. I know because two years ago, my dad died as a result of alcohol harm. In 2016, Scotland reached an unacceptable 10 year peak with 2,132 people dying as a result of alcohol and drugs misuse. We have a long way to go. Can I ask the First Minister to join me in sending a message to everyone in Scotland affected by drug and alcohol harm that they matter, that they are not to blame and that they are deserving of support? First Minister. Yeah, thank you. Um, 
Can I thank Monica Lennon for raising that issue and can I also pay tribute to her courage given her personal experience in standing up in the chamber today uh, and raising issues that are often deeply personal to people but hugely important to our society as a whole. Uh, Monica Lennon is, is absolutely right. First of all, we must see those uh, who suffer from addiction uh, as human beings first and foremost. That's why I, I ended my first answer by saying we must treat these issues from a public health perspective first and foremost and that is what our renewed strategy will be seeking to do uh, and we must make sure and this is uh, why we have set out plans for additional funding we must make sure that when people do find the courage to come forward and seek help that help is there from them uh, for them uh, from the services uh, that Monica Lennon ha has spoken about um, you know, these uh, people find themselves uh, with addiction and, and dealing with uh, drug or, or alcohol uh, problems, uh, often because of other factors uh, in their lives. And it's, it's those underlying factors, as well as their needs as human beings, that must be absolutely uppermost in our minds. So um, I uh, would be happy to uh, talk to Monica Lennon at greater length about these issues uh, based on the experience she's uh, shared with us today. But I think all of us across the chamber will agree that that kind of sentiment must be the driving force behind the changes that we're seeking to make. And we'll squeeze in question number seven from Lee MacArthur. Very much indeed, President Officer. To ask the First Minister whether the Scottish Government will provide an update on the management of Police Scotland and the Scottish Police Authority. First Minister. Well, significant work is now underway across Police Scotland and the Scottish Police Authority to give effect to Policing 2026, which is a long-term transformational strategy published by the service in June of this year. Uh, the process of appointing a new SPA chair is ongoing and work to identify an interim chief officer for the authority began this week. Steps are also being taken to strengthen Police Scotland's executive team through the appointment of a new deputy chief constable uh, with that process due to be completed in the coming weeks. Lee MacArthur. Uh, thank you, uh, President Officer. Reports today suggest the Independent Inspectorate will be scathing about what it calls this government's politically motivated dismantling of the British Transport Police in Scotland. This follows a summer that has seen the Chief Constable under investigation and the SPA Chief Executive, uh, like the Chair, heading out the door. Will the First Minister now agree to the call by the Justice spokespeople of all four opposition parties, myself included, for change for the next Chair of the SPA to be appointed by this Parliament, not solely Ministers, recognising our collective interest in seeing the mess that's been created sorted out? First Minister. Well, as it happens, I'm not entirely unsympathetic to the, the case that Liam MacArthur has made there. I would simply point out, and I'm, I'm sure members will understand why I, I point this out, uh, that the process of appointment is actually laid down in the legislation. It's a requirement of the Police and Fire Reform Scotland Act that Scottish ministers appoint the chair of the SPA. Uh, where the Parliament has a role in appointments, for example, the Information Commissioner, the Children's Commissioner, this generally is set out in relevant legislation. That's not the case for the SPA, but ministers will carefully consider the case put forward and whether there is a role that Parliament could play within the framework set by the Police and Fire Reform Act. And I know the Justice Secretary would be happy uh, to have further discussions on that matter. Thank you very much. Uh, that concludes uh, First Minister's questions. Before we move on, I just point out to members that we have taken 48 minutes to get through First Minister's questions today, and, but we've only had 11 members able to make a contribution. Now, a number of members and the responses have been too lengthy. Members are giving huge preambles before asking their question, and some of the responses are too long. Can I urge, I've, I've written to all members, I've spoken to all the party leaders, it's clearly not having an effect, can I ask you to think about it, and before next week, make your questions shorter and please also the answers more succinct. And we will get through more and more members will be able to participate. Okay? We now move on to members' business in the name of Alec Rowley. And we'll just take a few moments to change seats.